Because either you gave very bad advice because uh, you have 30,000 civilians who got killed, or they didn't listen to your advice. So uh, what, uh, what, what about Rafa? Do you think they would... Are they actually listening to what you're saying? Uh, because they said, you know, if we don't have the U.S. on board, we're going it alone. There are some reports that um, Israelis feel that depended, their ability to depend on the United States um, has now decreased because of the abstention that the Security Council vote yesterday. Can you just speak to that um, and the relationship right now? On, on your point about Israel being a sovereign country and the U.S. can't tell them what to do, back in May 19th, 2021, you have uh, Joe Biden telling Netanyahu, his quote was, hey, man, we are out of runway here. It's over. And it was over. Ronald Reagan famously did the same back in 1982, told him it was over. Why can't he say it's over this time? Does that mean he it supports the continuation of this war, even if it means going into Russia? It's a little bit mind-boggling to me. Since when is a UN resolution, a Security Council UN resolution, not non-binding? Uh, because that's a significant shift. That's not the understanding of most countries, and it's not the understanding of the UN either. This is not a Chapter 7 uh, resolution. Uh, so I don't get how the U.S. is now saying that it would be non-binding and basically giving the message that another country wouldn't necessarily need to comply with it. So let me uh, explain what we meant by that. First of all, as we uh, said yesterday and we made clear all along, we have always believed that the path to a ceasefire and the release of hostages is something that will um, be reached through negotiations uh, between Israel and Hamas, uh, enabled by third party countries uh, in, in, and in which the United States is participating, and not through a UN process, and that remains our uh, belief. <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, we when we say the resolution is non-binding, what we mean is that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties the way, for example, some UN resolutions that uh, uh, impose obligatory sanctions, impose actual requirements on people to implement them. That said, we do believe that even though there are uh, this resolution lacks non-binding pr provisions and lacks um, uh, new requirements that it is imposed on the parties, it does carry weight and it is something that should be implemented. But, I mean, that's a little bit contradictory, if I may. I mean, he, either it's binding or it's non-binding. If it's non-binding, like you said, because it lacks provisions, why would anybody comply with it? It's non-binding in that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties, but we do believe it should be respected, that it carries weight, and that it should be implemented, as has always been the case, as always been our belief when it comes to UN Security Council resolutions. Sure. Okay. So if this was non-binding, now, the other resolutions, the three resolutions that you vetoed, were they also in the same, the same kind of resolution? Uh, so, Saeed, I'd have to go back and look at the provisions of those, but we vetoed them, so ultimately they weren't, uh, they weren't the voice of the UN Security so Council. I'm saying if they are not binding, then why bother and veto it? Because, uh, so, they, they carry weight and should be implemented, and so we want to see resolutions that pass uh, ultimately reflect the policy positions of the United States, which is what I said yesterday. <clears throat> we came to the determination that this uh, Security Council resolution, although it did contain or it lacked some provisions that we wanted to see, uh, most notably uh, condemning Hamas's actions on October 7th, that it ultimately it called for two things that we support, uh, host uh, a ceasefire and the release of hostages together. And so that's why we abstained from the resolution. We do believe that it carries weight and should be implemented. There are some reports that um, Israelis feel that depended, their ability to depend on the United States um, has now decreased because of the abstention that the Security Council vote yesterday. Can you just speak to that um, and the relationship right now? So absolutely not. The First of all, the relationship between the United States and Israel is one that is longstanding. They are a longstanding ally of the United States. And the president has made clear that the United States will always support Israel's right to defend itself. That was true before uh, our action in the, Security Council res uh, in the Security Council yesterday. It remains true today. Um, as I said yesterday, the position that uh, we take and the position that was contained in that resolution that led us to not block its, its uh, moving forward is that 
there should be a ceasefire and there should be the release of hostages. That is our position. We have believed it has been Israel's position because Israel has been negotiating to try to achieve a ceasefire that would secure the release of hostages. So uh, far from there being, at least in our eyes, any distance between the United States and Israel, um, we believe the position that we were endorsing the United Nations yesterday is the same one that Israel has been trying to achieve through the ongoing negotiations. Now, none of that is to say there are not things with which we disagree with Israel. There obviously are. There have been a number of things uh, in recent months uh, that where we have had disagreements with them, and we've been very direct and candid with them in our conversations about those disagreements, and those, of course, have been well aired in public at this podium and in other places. Just to clarify, what, what does it mean to, to say that it should be, <clears throat> that the resolution should, should be implemented? For, from the Israeli point of view, I guess they would say there's no, there's no deal to be, to be taken at the moment, so um, you know, how, how can they implement? It goes back to the f first point I made, which is that we believe a ceasefire and the release of hostages will be uh, ultimately secured through negotiations. And it's the negotiations that we have been pursuing uh, in the region, most recently over the weekend in Doha. And so we are going to continue to pursue those negotiations to reach a ceasefire um, and release, secure the release of all hostages. Yeah, yeah, go, uh, go ahead. Wondering on, on Rafa, I mean, you've been very clear from the very beginning that you don't dictate uh, operate policy or operations to Israel. You've said that numerous times. You said you're not involved in the military planning. Here, you're telling them not to do a major scale, uh, offensive in Rafah, but you're giving them or want to talk to them about alternatives, whatever they may be, counterterrorism, what have you, I, uh, I don't know specifically. But by doing that, you would get directly involved in the operations that were to take place in Rafa, and potentially you know, there could be more civilian deaths and what have you. So in that case, you would be directly involved. How, how big of a problem is that? So I don't agree with that. Let me say a few things. Number one, when it comes to dictating, you're right. No, we do not dictate to them. We can't dictate to them. They're a sovereign country, and the United States can't dictate to any sovereign country. They're going to make their own decisions, and they have been quite clear about that, and we would expect nothing less from any sovereign country. That said, we always offer our best advice to them. Uh, we have done that from the beginning. You've heard the president talk about that when he went to Israel just a week after, uh, or a little over a week after October 7th, where he talked about the fact that um, Israel is, because Israel is such a longtime friend, we are gonna it, offer advice about them, oftentimes colored by the mistakes that we have made and the experiences that we have learned from mistakes that we have made in our past and how we have conducted uh, military operations. And so well, we try- very good advice. And so we try, no, no, so we, we try to give them, we try to give them that advice. In terms of the options that we will present to them or that I assume we will present to them at some point, um, I wouldn't think of it as military planning. We're gonna offer them, uh, and I also don't wanna preview uh, too much in, in, in detail publicly because these are still conversations that ought to happen privately, but the intent would be to, to give them advice about how to conduct such operations. It's not to do actual military planning, for example, what to do, when, how, with that level of specificity. When I, come, when I talk about we're not involved in military planning, that's what I mean. We're not in, in uh, with them planning exact military operations, but we have always offered them advice about what we have believed the best way to go about this operation is. That's true going back to some of the first meetings that we had uh, in Israel right after October 7th. Well, then either one of two things. Either you gave very bad advice because uh, you have 30,000 civilians who got killed, or they didn't listen to your advice. So uh, what, uh, what, what about Rafa? You think they would... Are they actually listening to what you're saying? Uh, because they said, you know, if we don't have the U.S. on board, we're going it alone. So they, they will speak for themselves, but we have not yet had the meeting where we, we outline um, the steps that we believe that, that they ought to take. Thank you. I appreciate it. A couple more uh, questions. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Palestinian Red Cross just announced that an Emil hospital in Khan Yunus has been completely shut down. The Israeli army throughout the patient, the staff, and so on, and put, you know, uh, dirt, whatever, and they closed it off, and so on. Are you aware of this? So I haven't seen that exact report. I've seen reports of operations at hospital. Well, hold, hold on, hold on, Sight. Just let me finish. Yeah. Uh, 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 I've seen reports of operations at hospitals. I haven't seen that specific one, and I know that oftentimes we've gotten, uh, especially over the past few days, conflicting information uh, from Palestinian sources and Israeli sources about exactly what is going to happen. So I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make a definitive comment absent um, definitive information. What I will say, uh, two things. Number one, 
we generally don't want to see operations at hospitals. But number two, we have see, you ha have seen over the past few weeks that areas that had been cleared by Israel, that Hamas fighters have flown have, have flowed back in and are inside hospitals. And so while we don't want to see operations in hospitals, we also don't believe that Hamas should be hiding there. And we would again encourage them to stop hiding behind patients in hospitals. Uh, any more on Israel before I go on? Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Just on, on your point about Israel being a sovereign country in the U.S., can't tell them what to do. Back in May 19th, 2021, you have uh, Joe Biden telling Netanyahu, his quote was, hey, man, we are out of runway here. It's over. And it was over. Ronald Reagan famously did the same back in 1982, told him it was over. Why can't he say it's over this time? Does that mean he it supports the continuation of this war, even if it means going into Rafa? So we support Israel's uh, ability to defeat Hamas. We support Israel's legitimate security objectives. We support um, uh, them ensuring that October 7th can never happen again. And so we continue to support their ability to do that while offering as I, them, as I said, our best uh, advice on how to, uh, to go about that campaign. And that's what we'll continue to do.